Campylobacter jejuni is the topic for this video. And um, this is a bug that is comma shaped and it is gram negative, gram negative bacilli, sometimes uh, referred to as a gram negative rod. So that will be uh, definitely part of clinical vignettes, so please remember that. So let's get into this. What does C. jejuni, abbreviated C. jejuni campylobacter, what does it cause? Well, most of you probably know that it causes diarrhea. And it, and it can occur at pretty much any age, but the peak incidence is between ages 1 and 5. So a lot of children get this infection. And the source of the infection is contaminated food. And there's many different types of food that can cause diarrhea. So the type of food is actually very important uh, in clinical vignettes. The type of food that's most commonly mentioned on licensing exams is chicken or poultry, same thing. And in particular, what they're talking about, of course, is undercooked. Um, it's also been associated with um, water um, in outbreaks. Now, what's important about this is that it causes the type of diarrhea that is known as bloody diarrhea. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but I just wanted to mention that really quickly. What I'm trying to do is, in this presentation, is give you the key points that you can sort of use to differentiate this type of di diarrhea from other types, because there's numerous types of diarrheas and there's numerous um, pathogens that can cause diarrhea. So on a clinical vignette, it may become confusing as to which type of diarrhea is it and which bug. So before I get into symptoms of the diarrhea, I wanted to mention two very important types of complications that can occur because of C. jejuni, other, other than diarrhea. There, there's two that I would like to mention. There's post-infectious neuropathy, and then there's post-infectious arthritis. And um, these are commonly tested. The post-infectious arthritis can occur in patients that have this specific um, gene that they're positive to HLA B27 and it can present uh, several a few days to several weeks after an episode of C. jejuni and diarrhea. The post-infectious neuropathy is actually very important because it can lead to something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. A uh, post-infectious neuropathy it involves both the upper, um, it involves both the motor and sensory nerves, and it can happen in up to 30% of uh, cases of C. jejuni diarrhea. And what's important about this is that you need to actually analyze the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, for diagnosis. The stool culture is not used um, because the stool culture often is negative. But these are very important points about C. jejuni on the licensing exams. So let's go back to C. jejuni diarrhea and let's talk about the symptoms. Well, as always, you know, diarrhea by itself is a symptom and, and that's pretty, you know, broad. But I would like to present some of the things that kind of will help you differentiate this diarrhea from other types. One, of course, is bloody, because not all diarrhea is bloody. Some diarrhea is just watery. Another thing is abdominal pain. And another thing is fever. Not all types of diarrhea will have fever. So hopefully these um, symptoms, along with the history of ingestion of poultry or chicken, um, will be present in the vignette and that will help guide you to the correct answer. Diagnosis. I think I quickly touched upon this when I was talking about Guillain-Barre. You have to do a stool culture. And 
Stool cultures, when you, there's amazing how many different types of tests you can do with the stool. You can check stool for WBC count. You can check stool for gram stain. You can do a culture. You can check the stool for ova and parasites. Um, you can, of course, check the stool for blood. It's amazing, but a stool culture uh, will definitely give you the uh, correct um, organism involved. Treatment. Uh, the treatment is antibiotics, or ABX, my abbreviation for antibiotics. And the most commonly used erythromycin type antibiotics, erythromycin, azithromycin, and the other one is ciprofloxacin. Um, this is probably preferred because there's a lot of growing uh, resistance and the resistance to Cipro is growing so this is probably the preferred choice so let's um, look at some clinical vignettes 23 year old man develops explosive watery diarrhea with blood fecal leukocytes which is white blood cells and mucus approximately three days after eating chicken that was improperly cooked comma shaped organisms were found in the fecal smear along with red blood cells and leukocytes, which of the following pathogens is most likely the cause of these symptoms. Well, very good vignette. We've got the poultry ingestion, tells you improperly cooked. You've got the bloody diarrhea. And um, you've got, um, they even mentioned the comma-shaped um, organism. And of course, they're talking about Campylobacter jejuni. Um, let's go through these just in case you're wondering. This type actually is a traveler's diarrhea. And the traveler's diarrhea, uh, the clinical vignette will probably be presented a little bit more differently. Uh, Shigella is actually not comma shaped, the Shigella organism. Staph aureus is actually um, also causes diarrhea, but the types of food are different. The types of food in the clinical vignette would be either potato salad, uh, mayonnaise, mayo, and vibrio is uh, watery diarrhea. There would not be any blood. So, next one. 34-year-old perfume saleswoman presents complaining of lower abdominal cramps and diarrhea. She has no prior history of GI illness and began not noting frequent loose stools three days earlier. The stools have subsequently become bloody and associated with urgency and nocturnal bowel movements. She has also developed an increased temperature. On exam, she has mild periumbilical and left lower quadrant tenderness. Um, on rectal exam, the stool is bloody. Which of the following organisms is likely causing her symptoms? Well, this um, definitely is right along the lines of C. jejuni. You got the bloody diarrhea and you got the fever and she's describing abdominal pain. Um, so let's go through this and see if we can uh, eliminate some of these. So sometimes it's not that easy. Well, this causes a, a watery diarrhea and it's also a traveler's diarrhea. Travelers. Uh, Staph aureus, I think, think I touched upon this earlier, is the types of food. Unfortunately, they don't mention the foods in this uh, clinical vignette. Um, Staph aureus is uh, food poisoning and it can present with a lot of nausea and vomiting, so she doesn't really have that in the clinical vignette. Giardia is a non bloody diarrhea. Cryptosporidium is actually a diarrhea that affects AIDS patients. So by process of elimination, I came to A, and also it does match the clinical vignette. Not entirely obvious, but it does match. And then finally, the last one. A 14-year-old male with a complaint of soreness and weakness in his legs for the past day that has slowly spread from his calves to his thighs. He now complains of weakness in his trunk and arms. On exam, he appears tired and lays on the examination table. His temperature is 98, pulse is 48, temp respirations are 22. Both of his legs are diffusely tender. 
DTRs are absent in lower extremities and sensation is greatly diminished. Which of the following studies is essential for this diagnosis? Well, a difficult question. This is um, basically describing a, um, as you can see, it start it from the calves, went up to the thighs, and then later the trunk and arms. So it's sort of this ascending um, uh, sensation. It says that in here, where the sensation is greatly diminished. So it looks like this is an ascending paralysis. What this patient has actually is Guillain-Barre syndrome. And um, this um, is basically, I talked about this, is the post-infectious uh, neuropathy. Now, C. jejuni, which is the topic for this video, can lead, C. jejuni diarrhea, can lead to this Guillain-Barre in up to 30% of cases. So what they're asking is what is the diagnosis? Well, at first you might think it's B, right? Because that's what it screams out at you. But unfortunately, stool cultures are not useful to, di to diagnose Guillain-Barre because by the time the person develops the Guillain-Barre, the stool cultures are negative. The way to diagnose um, Guillain-Barre is by analyzing the cerebrospinal fluid and that will reveal uh, the necessary lab findings that can conclusively uh, show that the person has Guillain-Barre. So even though it's associated with Campylobacter jejuni, the stool cultures are not helpful in the diagnosis.